June marks the 44th annual Black Music Month. Here at the Chris David Show, we're celebrating by bringing you exclusive interviews with people who made momentous contributions to Black music. Deanna Williams was at the helm of the Philadelphia soul music movement. Having worked with everyone from Teddy Pendergrass to Jill Scott, her career in music and broadcasting has spanned a remarkable seven decades. In 1990, she, along with media entrepreneur Sheila Eldridge, launched the Association of African American Music Foundation to promote and preserve Black music. Liz Williams also helped write House Concurrent Bill 509 which recognized our accomplishments in music and helped establish Black Music Mall. On June 8, 2023, she, along with Kenny Gamble, was honored by Philadelphia City Hall with a proclamation commemorating Black Music Mall, as well as her contributions to the arts. Without further ado, let's all give a warm Chris David Show welcome to music historian, activist, veteran TV and radio personality, and hip hop's artist whisperer. The legendary, iconic Ms. Deanna Williams. Welcome, Ms. Deanna. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming by. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you. When I was planning this series, I, I had to reach out to you first because I had to have the mother of all of this on. So thank you again for coming and sharing your time with all of us. Now, um, My now we recently lost an icon, a legend, a star, a statement the Tina Turner. I want you to tell everyone why Tina's contribution was so important, not just to Black music, but to music as a whole. Tina Turner, born in Nutbush, Tennessee, uh, anime Bullock, became a global sensation, not just with her incredible distinct voice, but her performance style that inspired and informed generations of artists. You can clearly look at Beyonce and see Tina Turner. You can look at Rihanna and see that they are the daughters of Tina Turner. She was an arena performer. She broke box office records at a time where Black women were not performing as solo artists in arenas, but she did. And furthermore, she was dubbed appropriately the mother of rock and roll. So everyone from Mick Jagger, who cited in many interviews that he replicated, duplicated, imitated Tina Turner's style on stage in terms of being a very vibrant performer. Eric Clapton, the Beatles, the list is long of white, black, Latino, Asian, people who are confused about what they are, they've cited the brilliance, the majesty of Tina Turner. Absolutely. And you know, I saw you a few weeks ago on, on Mike. Well, it's called Good Day Philadelphia. Philly people, we call it Mike. Um, and you, I saw you with your Tina Turner doll. And I, my Tina Turner doll. I had no idea they even made those. I was so fascinated by that. Yeah, it was as um, soon as it hit the market, I was one of the consumers. And then, as I mentioned on Good Day Philadelphia, on the Mike and Alex show, because my Alex is my girlfriend. Yes, I love her. At the Roots picnic. Uh, I, I literally loved Tina Turner to the point where I wanted to meet her. She's one of the few artists. I've been friends with Aretha Franklin and Patti LaBelle. Teddy Pendergrass was my borrow a cup of sugar neighbor and my best male friend to his transition and I helped his wife organize his memorial service and I delivered the eulogy. So I have met many stellar individuals from Ronald Isley to Natalie Cole, you name it. I've been in the music industry 50 years, but she is the one, Tina Turner, who eluded me. And now I'm on the hunt for Grace Jones. So that's the only other person I want to meet 
So anybody has a Grace Jones hookup for Sister Deanna, do not hesitate to reach me on social media. And when you guys get that hookup, you let me know, because I want to be there when you meet Grace, because I love me some Grace. I, I love yeah. where this is going because you're, we'll get to it a little later, but you're mentioning so many things that are going on right now in my phone. Um, but you know, what I loved about Tina was that she just, what you said, she inspired so many people. Like I remember about a year ago, I was watching uh, RuPaul's Drag Race and Lizzo was on and Lizzo's outfit was inspired by Mad Max by Tina's outfit and Mad Max. She was a movie star on top of everything exactly. else. She was a movie star. Exactly. And she was someone who became, who, who overcame adversity and went on to just be so carefree. And black girls indeed do rock. I'm just gonna leave that at that. I'm gonna keep it moving. Great book that I have to tell you though, Chris. It, yes. It's written by Danielle Smith and it's called Shine Bright. And it's I know celebrates. who she is. Okay, Danielle yes. um, is now writing for the New York Times. She was an editor at Vibe magazine. Uh -huh. She is a spectacular individual from, from the West Coast, the Oakland area. Mm -hmm. But the book Shine Bright, and she has a podcast as well, celebrates the legacy of the grand dams of great female artists from Angela Bofield to Tina Turner and others. You're, Ms. Deanna, you're bringing up so many people that I mm -hmm. love who are just... In, in my phone, in my in my playlist, like all the time. And, and Danielle, by the way, guys, is D-A-N-Y-E-L, Danielle Smith. Now, speaking exactly. of rock, you were the first Black woman rock DJ. And I actually have up a post commemorating you on my Chris David TV uh, IG page. It was for Women's History Month. And uh -huh. I want to thank you for paving the way and giving Black women opportunities in radio and media. And I just want to, I have to shout out Ms. Kathy Hughes, as well oh. as your girls, your ladies over at Influence, Daisha, K. Fox, and Laia. I had to say it like that. I had to throw that in there. Philly people just got off the phone with Laia a few moments before we started talking. And before that, Kathy Hughes, who is my best friend, who I'm having breakfast with tomorrow morning. I adore that. That is just. And I don't even know if Laia remembers me. I met Laia on Inauguration Eve, or Inauguration Day of 2008 before we elected Barack Obama. I met her at Ishka Bibbles on South Street. I was on break. <laughs> <laughs> I was on break from class. I went to Temple and I was on break and I, and I was like, wait a minute, Laia? And she was just so friendly, so open, love her, adore her. She's my goddaughter. Is she? Disclosure, she is my oldest. I love all my godchildren. Yes. But I'm very, very, very close oh. with Laia. She and I are, colla we've collaborated on nice. several photo exhibitions and um, painting exhibitions. Her father is a noted photographer, Ron St. Clair. And we did an exhibition of his work some years ago at the Art Sanctuary in Philadelphia. And we are in the midst, in the very midst of doing a book of Ron St. Clair's photographs. So she is more than my goddaughter, more than one of my best friends and my confidant. She is a collaborator, a curator, co-curator. We did an exhibition of Ron St. Clair's work last year at the National Museum of African-American Music, Fifth and Broadway in Nashville, Tennessee. So, and I call her the podcast queen because she currently produces and is the co-host of three podcasts. Soon I can get her over there here to help me do some of this because I do all of this myself. I could maybe, hopefully, one day, one day. Um, and I do want to know too, later on we'll talk. I want to know what you and Kathy Hughes are going to go have for breakfast. Well, she wrote me and asked me if they have turkey bacon. I introduced her to turkey bacon from the Amish some years ago. So when Kathy comes to Philadelphia, she always wants turkey bacon. So at some point in my hectic schedule today, I am going to go to Reading Terminal in Philadelphia and buy mm -hmm. some turkey bacon for her to take back with her to the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., and maybe take some with me to the restaurant. We have a reservation and see if they'll make it just for her. Mm. Ms. Deanna, I'm a foodie. You're doing, listen, we about to go okay. down another road. How did you get started in the music business all those years ago? 
I got started in the music business, I would say 1971 to I graduated from high school, Washington Irving High School in 1971. And then I graduated and went to City College in New York in the heart of Harlem. I grew up in Harlem and City College was on 138th and Convent. The campus was pretty sprawling, but in the heart of Harlem. And I was asked to meet somebody to this second. I can't remember who asked me to meet them at the radio station. I didn't even know we had a college campus radio station, but the moment that I walked into the facility, it was like a lightning bolt struck me and I discovered my affinity for radio. I saw the microphones, the turntables, all the records, and I was very knowledgeable about black music since I was way young. I used to study flute with the great jazz musician, Jimmy Heath. I studied at the IS-201 Jazz Mobile Program established by Dr. Billy Taylor. So music was in the core of my spirit, uh, but I wasn't talented as a musician. I wish, I wanted to be Bobby Humphrey, you know, but homegirl, me, I couldn't improvise. So I had to let that go. But when I went to the radio station at my college, that was it. I enrolled in a course. I learned how to run the board. I learned the basic rudiments of radio. And then I took over the radio station. I became the music director, had my own show. And beyond that, I got a hold of the budget, the student budget to produce concerts. And it was the beginning of my role as a live talent producer. So I used to use those the money from City College to bring everybody from Gary Bartz to Hubert Laws, who was my then boyfriend when I was in college. So yeah, it started in college, but my my benefits and steady paycheck in radio okay. happened when I was hired at WHUR 96.3 on the eve of my 19th birthday. So I was 18 when I did the interview and they hired me. The next day I turned 19. And shortly thereafter, I borrowed some Greyhound money from my mama because I had no money. I was a college student and I took the Greyhound and I moved into the YWCA. I had a small little room. It was basically a bed and I could reach out and touch both walls. And I was offered $6,000 contract. But the station that I worked for, this was 1973, the station was owned by Howard University. It still is. It's um, a heritage station, but it's in the middle of the dial, 96.3. And it is a well-known station. It's the home of the original Quiet Storm uh, at WHUR. But before that, there was Ebony Moonbeams, which was my handle in radio. So 50 years ago, this coming November, but I literally have to count. I mean, I was in college doing radio in... 72, but official in terms of checks, benefits, consistency, 1973, it's 2023 now, so 50 years. Now you and Kenny Gamble, who you had a long musical partnership with, you were recently honored down in Philly by City Hall, and shout out to Philly too, because Philly, you're about to get your first black woman mayor, okay? Because I know she's gonna win. And I yeah, know. Sherelle Parker. Yeah. Sherelle Parker. Council um, Richardson, Gilmore Richardson, uh, presented the resolution for the proclamation recognizing two of the founders of Black Music Month, Kenny Gamble and myself. Uh, Ed Wright, part of that configuration. But because we're Philadelphians, we still live in this community. We were recognized in city council. I made remarks. It was touching beautiful and it's there's no place like home even though i'm a native new yorker i will never abandon where i'm from i'm a girl from, i was born in queens raised as a little girl in the bronx and a teenager in harlem i have been in philadelphia longer than where i was born however my mother tells me i was conceived in philadelphia now, i gotta drop a bomb that, for that because that and shout out to her <laughs> shout out to my mother and yes. father. Yes, shout my out to did, them. My mother didn't and couldn't do it without oh, him. Yeah. Wow. And I was just going to ask you that. See, this is how I know we're in sync, because I was just going to ask you, 
because you mentioned City College. I used to live in, in Harlem, like right down the street from there. And um, well, you know where it is. Yeah. I know. I'm, I'm well, very familiar with it with the area. But see, here's the thing. You're originally from the Bronx. Which neighborhood are you from in the Bronx? Well, up near Gun Hill Road. Oh, okay. uh, we lived on a small street called Stickney Place. And yeah. up near Gun Hill Road is where we lived. That was a little girl. It's interesting because a friend of mine, he actually, his name is Vincent Davis. He had, he produced the early Keith Sweat records, the entertainment records. Nice. And he lives still not far from my house that I grew up in. So one day we were talking and I said, Vincent, since you live right around the corner, can you just go take a picture of my old house? And when he went, he was taking pictures of, it was 1461 Stickney Place. The owners observed him snapping pictures of the house and they were like, and then, you know, he was explaining that he was just taking right, pictures right. for the family of relative, um, a friend of his that lived in the house as a child. So yeah, shout out to the Boogie Down Bronx, the home of hip hop. Yes. And we're gonna get to that too. I'm gonna get to okay. that too. Cause I got, listen, Miss Deanna, I was ready for you. I was okay, prepared. So like I'm gonna show you something real quick. This is my mouse pad that I use. Cool. That's, that's, that's vintage. It is, it is. And I mean, I graduated there in 09. So it very vintage, <laughs> very vintage. Oh, so you graduated from, you graduated from my art, our school. From, you yeah, the same school. back in 09. And then I graduated from uh, Seton Hall um, I went there for strategic communication and, and uh, strategic, they call it strategic communication and leadership. It's probably called something else now because their school changes so much. But I graduated from there in 2012. And um, yeah, I'm, Ms. Ms. Deanna, I'm trying to do it. I'm trying to, I'm trying to work it out. I'm trying to work it out. No, but, no, no, you, no, no. You remove trying, you are actually I'm doing. I'm doing. Don't use the word trying. You, okay. you are actually engaged in doing it. Thank you. I am. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm dedicated. Now, yeah. you mentioned this really briefly earlier. You talked about the flute. And I wanted to know if you had any musical talents growing mm -hmm. up. I mentioned I played the flute. I, I pulled out my flute, which is very, very, very old. <laughs> I pulled it out in front of my grandson. His name is Luke gamble recently and i posted on my instagram it's a precious picture i'm in my bedroom hadn't even combed my hair anything and my grandson and i are kicking it and i said to him i said you know luke nana used to play the flute and i pull my flute out the case and i assemble it and i put it up and i start playing now my flute this flute is out of tune it has not been tuned up in a long time but i pull it out of the case and I start just doing some runs and my grandson goes like this. There's a picture of him in the oh, bed. Move. I'm sitting on the edge of my bed and he puts his hands over his ears. It's such a priceless picture. And, and he had his hands over his ears because his Nana. Not come so on good. now, Luke, you can't do Nana like that. Now, come on. Uh, Luke, Luke did it and I get uh, why he did it. He was right to put his hands yeah. over his ears. Well, listen. But yeah, no flute talent. We might we might have to call up Lizzo and get her to come over and give you some lessons. Now, I would love to take okay. some lessons from Lizzo. That would be great. Yeah. When I saw Lizzo playing flute many years ago before she became Lizzo, she was she used to perform with Prince. So she's been around for a minute. A lot of people are just discovering her, but I peeped her a while ago. So yeah, no musical talent oh. uh, other than the appreciation the absorption of music. My father played music when we were in, living in the Bronx all the time. I remember Saturdays when we would be cleaning the house, my daddy bl was blasting the radio. And so I became um, an aficionado of listening to radio DJs and of course, black music. And I need to do this really quick. I have to make a quick retraction from last week's show. So I had on my on last week's show, I had that it was the 33rd year of Black Music Month. It's actually the 44th. So 44th, not 33rd. 33rd was actually the 
commemorating the House Concurrent Bill. So in 1990, just had and to that's that the story you. in and of itself that I'm, I continuously deal with because in 2008, when Barack Obama became president, the name got changed to African American Music Appreciation Month, and that is not what Kenny Gamble, Ed Wright nor the music industry for at that point, some 30 something years had referred to Black Music Month. And so I am honored to say that the Biden administration in the most recent proclamation that was sent to me on May 31st says, Black Music Month, which is, the, so I'm happy about the restoration of the name, I've written the White House. In fact, I've been back to the White House recently, twice in the last month or so. So I have been able to express in writing and also in person my gratitude for the restoration of the name. And some people would say, why is it important? Well, as you well know, words have great importance and the names of things are significant. And the history and the her story of the establishment of Black Music Month should not be changed. And so I am elated that my letter writing, I'm a fierce, I'm, I'm assertive when it comes to, and I know I can maybe annoy people at sometimes, but I don't care. Not that I don't care about annoying people, but I don't care that at one point the White House wrote me and said, we have all of your messages. And when I read that, I was like, oops, oh, okay. So if it was like, fall back, young lady, Okay, we heard you loud and clear the first email, right. but it's what got me into the White House in the first time when I went in to meet privately with President Clinton uh, after the White House called me and said, we see where President Jimmy Carter, June 7th, 1979, hosted a reception for the Black music industry and for the Black Music Association, but he forgot to sign the presidential proclamation. And I didn't quite understand at that time what it meant, but the White House said, go to Congress, get some legislation, get them to declare June Black Music Month and then come back to us and we'll set you up with a meeting with President Bill Clinton. Took me a couple of years, letter writing, calls, and this is pre-internet, mm -hmm. um, but I got it done again, That all that writing. And then yeah. I went up to Capitol Hill knocking on people's doors. I didn't even understand. You got to make appointments if you want to see the congressman or the senator. But I enabled um, my, my process with getting uh, the congressional rep from Philadelphia at the time, Congressman Shaka Fatah, who actually introduced the bill to the House of Representatives. And on the state, on the Senate side, I had the support of Republican Senator Arlen Specter, who is deceased now, but he was like, what do you need and want me to do? I said, I need you to write the president. I need you to support my efforts to get June established as Black Music Month. So that's the origin story. But the idea of Black Music Month came initially from my dear lifelong friend, the father of my children, Kenny Gamble, and one of my favorite songwriters, and my just my teacher, my my inspiration, Kenny Gamble. I hope you all heard that because mm -hmm. I, I really say, and I say this all the time, Ms. Deanna, I say that writing letters is a dying art. It's a dying art mm -hmm. form. And mm -hmm. right here while I'm talking to you, I'm making notes. I'm writing notes, I'm <laughs> marking up my paper. I write in blue pen so that I know that this is the original. Um, it, it's a dying art. It's a dying art form. And it's something that needs to come back. Listen, they are not teaching children how to write in cursive. So my first question when I heard that was, how are they going to sign their names if they don't know how to write in cursive? So I guess maybe they still know they're teaching print and what they're going to mm -hmm. print their name. Well, here's the or thing. I used to use... teach. I was a teacher. Okay. I taught. Okay. I actually taught in New York City. Um, oh. And I used to get in trouble with my principal because I was teaching my kids how to write in cursive. I taught seventh grade and I taught 11th grade and my 11th graders didn't know how to write in cursive. And this was 10 years ago. So this has been going uh, on for a long time. Yeah. And I had like, the cause I went to Catholic school. So I had the paper with the lines and then the dotted line in the middle. 
and I found it. I found it at like a at, at one of those like Catholic, you know, school shops. And I brought it into the school and I had them doing cursive. I said, because what are you going to do when you need to sign a document, when you get your driver's license or when you go to the bank and you open up a bank account, you sign forms. Everything is not DocuSign, you know? But, but that's what they're moving towards. I don't like it. I mean, that's where we are now. Mm -hmm. That's what I have to ask my grandson, Luke, does he know how to sign his name? Or you know what? I'm going to teach him if he doesn't know. I mean, he's going into the third grade, but that's okay. going to be my my next mission. And that was around the time, you know, name. we learned it like second, third grade, like around that. But mm -hmm. kind of... I went to Catholic school, too, for a minute. So you understand. In Puerto Rico. Okay, Catholic school in Spanish. Ooh. Okay. That's loaded. You know what? We, we're going to we're going to have to unpack that on another show because that, that's loaded. So very loaded. Yeah. How should someone who's serious about getting into the music industry as an artist pursue that in 2023? Well, the beauty of 2023, as we referenced the internet not long ago, is that there are tons of YouTube tutorials. You have access direct to artists, independent artists and artists signed to major labels. Um, so there's an opportunity. There's so much information. That's what I love about the internet. The fact that it is just a reservoir of knowledge. And so if you're an artist and you're interested in pursuing that as a career, there's a lot of information. Uh, uh, back in the day, there wasn't so much information. So how to get, there were books, like everything you need to know about the music business. My dear friend Kashif wrote a, a, a book, a series of books about the music business that I think are still in print, although he has been um, not with us physically in some time. But you can go online and you can learn about. And the thing, because of the internet, it takes out the middleman. You can release a song, put it on SoundCloud, you can and you can put it on YouTube and go direct to the consumer. And, and all of that is free. You can use those resources to, I know so many artists, in fact, I'll give you an example of one artist that I worked with some years ago because he's grown now and married, but I worked with him when he was maybe 16, 17, and he is Canadian and he used YouTube. He would get on YouTube and he had his own YouTube channel playing guitar, singing songs, and then he was discovered by his manager who found his way to the young man's mother and the rest is his story and his name is Justin Bieber. So many artists, because part of my business is I do artist development and media coaching. So Justin, along with many other artists that I have worked with were discovered on the internet, on YouTube, on SoundCloud. Uh, and even now I see people on Twitter and Instagram, you can do re reels and people and see, and you can begin to develop uh, support and an audience and following. So I say to young people who are interested and good and grown people, because no age barrier here with me, uh, I say, knowledge is power. The more information you have, the more powerful you become and, and you become, yeah, more valuable. So re-study, use this resource, these free resources to develop your capacity. And also be honest with yourself because some people want to be artists. They shouldn't be artists. They should be the artist manager or the publicist or the photographer or the makeup artist. Not everybody is meant to be on the mic, on the stage in front of an audience. And so a lot of people, I know so many people who they, they just, they ain't got it. Lately, there have been think pieces and op-eds and social media ramblings about the state of R&B. Now, what would you say to those who claim R&B is dead? I would ask them first to check their pulse and then make sure there's no wax in their ears because R&B is very much alive. Uh, it is very alive. This generation, I hear these critiques constantly. I just did, I've been doing a takeover 
of title during the month of June. And they asked me to do four playlists, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And I started working on it months ago because they asked that each playlist be at least 50 songs. And it was hard for me because 50, oh gosh. The first playlist I did for them, I did, I sent them maybe, I don't think, I, I, what was maybe 700 songs and they whittled it down to 300. But this year I, I did decades. And last year it was more of a gumbo of genres. It was mixed. This year I stuck mostly to R&B songs, 70s, 80s, 90s, and in the 2000s. So when I got to the 2000s playlist, I was playing music starting from 2000s straight on up to right now, 2023. And I will tell you that there are still viable R&B artists, young artists, some of them my clients. Uh, for instance, Daniel Caesar, he's R&B. He's straight up R&B. He doesn't claim he's Canadian, but he's an R&B artist. Uh, you have um, SZA, Tierra Wack. I'm, I'm talking about the young, the, the young ones now. You have Friday from Philadelphia. There's so many talented young people right now still doing R and B, rhythm and blues, or soul, or whatever you want to call it. But it's derivative of that genre of music. Uh, there, there, there's tons of them. I mean, I, I work with a lot of these artists. And some of them are more skilled and knowledgeable about what transpired prior to them. And some are still very, I worked with a young 18 year old uh, R&B artist who was signed to Def Jam. And I said, Teddy Pendergrass. And he was like, who? I said, Sam Cooke. And he said, who? I said, okay, young boy, I know you're 18, but I'm gonna need you to know what happened prior to you getting a deal. You need to know, you know, you are not the beginning of the genre. There were people who were doing it very well long before your parents met. Okay. So, but yes, R&B very much alive, thriving. It will not go anywhere, even though the number one dominant genre of music globally is hip hop, R&B is still viable. And then you have artists like Mary J. Blige, who's been in the game for a long time, the queen of hip hop soul. She is still releasing music currently. Uh, Maxwell, I uh, spoke to, I know for a fact that D'Angelo is still, I, I've heard some of the music. So he's still making music and he is, he is one of the, the forebearers of the genre. And, you know, we, we don't call it neo soul. We don't, it, it is soul music. So soul music, R&B, very much alive. Y'all heard what Miss Deanna said. And I'd be messy online. Because while Miss Deanna, she's a sweetheart, I'm not. I'll come for you. So behave. It's all good. It's all good. I, they can come for me too. I'm prepared. I have my spiritual shields all around me. I have my angels. I'm protected by Almighty God. So even when the devil tries to get in, and sometimes, you know, it's just knocking, and I see him knocking at the door, I'm like, be gone. Be gone. <clears throat> I mean, I have all that too, but I like to fight them. I like to, I like to give them something. Oh, you like to engage in the I fight? I like to give them just a little bit, not too much. Okay. I don't want to wear all myself right. out because I'm getting old. I can't be, can't be fighting everybody. Uh, well, well, since I'm triple your age, I, I've been in the fight in La Lucha Continua a long time. I'm not afraid of a fight either. Now, I remember a time in music, mm -hmm. honestly, in show business period, when everyone had to be versatile. I mean, however, today we get a lot of one note artists and no pun intended. Mm -hmm. Do you think the so-called triple threat will ever make a comeback? Triple, triple threat is still here. There are artists who are very talented, who are, they can sing, they can dance, they can perform, uh, they can act. I mean, you've got, we cannot discount um, the, the EGOT, uh, Jennifer. Jennifer Hudson. Hudson. Mm -hmm. I started to say holiday, but it's Hudson. Yeah. Jennifer Hudson. We love is, her too. Uh -huh. Yeah, we love her too. She's an EGOT. John Legend, an EGOT. Mm -hmm. They're they're EGOTs and they're still touring, making music. They're of course a little older than some of the artists that I referenced earlier, but 
there are people who are equally talented uh, in multiple areas of performance. They're here, there they're, they're are many of them. Now, I was sad, you know, over Tina's passing, just like I was with Michael and Whitney and, and Prince, not just because we lost, you know, another human being, but because they were great original talents. That mm -hmm. even though, you know, the, the, the talent's out there, I just feel like we'll probably never see anything like that again. And I just have this theory that, you know, I, I'll share with you. I, I normally, I share this with my friends, but it's, um, I call it a potluck theory. And, you know, when you have a potluck, you know, everybody's bringing something to the potluck. So James Brown, Aretha, Stevie, James Brown bought the content. Aretha was the vocal barometer and Stevie had the creativity. And then when you move on, you move a little forward in time, Michael was the one who kept the content flowing. Then Whitney was the vocal barometer and Prince was the creativity. It's just my theory, you know, that I had, you know, sometimes I, I just mm -hmm. come up with these things, you know, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to share that with you. Well, they all, first of all, James Brown, Aretha Franklin, James was called the Godfather of Soul. He mm -hmm. is part of the blueprint. Uh, he's definitively, but James Brown also was watching and listening to Little Richard who was one of the architects of rock and roll. Same thing with Bo Diddley, Chuck Berry. So every generation hears and sees and experiences what came before them. And these artists that you mentioned, they're an amalgamation of all of those people. When you hear D'Angelo, you are hearing the influence of George Clinton and Sly Stone. Those are his heroes. But D'Angelo, for example, extremely diverse in his knowledge of music, but his forefathers were some of those artists that I just mentioned, Sly, George Clinton, Eddie Hazel. I mean, he studied, he's a student of what happened before him. So when we hear D'Angelo's music, it's distinctly him, but it's a nod and it is an expression of admiration and affection for great artists before. So when you mentioned Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson and his family from Gary, Indiana, the Jackson Five, his brothers, and then of course Latoya and the great Janet Jackson, whose birthday party I went to just recently with my son, Khalif. Um, Michael Jackson studied James Brown. And you can see the influence of James Brown on Michael Jackson, not vocally, but performance wise. And so the artists that are real committed and serious about their craft and art, they've got to go back. You got to go back and hear and see Jackie Wilson. You got to hear Sam Cooke. You got to study their stories. I love, I love uh, documentaries. And so I am on a show called Unsung. I'm a, a on-camera commentator on the TV One Network, where an NAACP award-winning, image award-winning show. And many of the artists that I talk about, I know, I knew them or I know them. I've played their music on the radio. I just did a wonderful interview earlier this year with Shaka Khan for Hits Magazine that wound up being the cover. Uh, but here we go, but Shaka, she grew up in a house, her father was a diehard jazz lover. So she grew up listening to Sarah Vaughan, to Dinah Washington, to Ella Fitzgerald. And you can hear and feel them in Shaka, but Shaka has a very distinct voice and style. But she studied, she listened, she absorbed what transpired before her. So in my practice as a media coach doing artist development, I tell my clients, particularly the younger ones, got to go back. You got to study. You need to know who Charlie Wilson and the Gap Band are. You need to know who Charles Stepney was. You need to listen to Minnie Ripperton, The Rotary Connection, Earth, Wind and Fire. Maurice White was a drummer with Ramsey Lewis. You need to know the connections. All it's going to do is make you a stronger artist.
in the knowledge of and the observation of those artists. It's going to make you a stronger performer. And speaking of strong performance, you mentioned Shaka. My people know that I love Shaka Khan. And mm -hmm. on my IG, I have a video up. I went to see her actually uh, back in 2021 um, in Atlantic City. And mm -hmm. I was in the front row. So <gasps> I was the biggest, light-skinnedest, tallest guy there. <laughs> but I said, I got to see my Shaka. <laughs> so... Yeah, I kind of blocked yeah. everybody, but hey, Big I ain't care. I had to get those front row tickets. Like, I was literally, like, right there at Caesars. I, I just adore her. She's foxy. She's fiery. She's uh, sensual, sexual, you know. And then she's given us such a beautiful soundtrack from smoking room to um, everything. Everything yes. she did with Rufus and then everything that she's done. I was just listening to her the other day. She told me a great story about Joni Mitchell, who's one of her inspirations. And Shaka said, she said to Joni that she was gonna record a specific song. And Joni was like, oh no, no, no. I want you to do Ladies Man. So I invite you to go back and listen to her rendition of Joni Mitchell's Ladies Man. Fabulous. And she is also intending to do a full Joni Mitchell tribute album where she is recording her favorite Joni Mitchell song. So that's that's the one I'm, I'm waiting on. First. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Heard it first. Yes. I got it from Shaka. Yes. Direct on the Chris Davis show. Look at this. Look at that. Exclusive. Exclusive. Miss Dieta, you can't hear it, but I'm dropping all kinds of sound effects in the background. <laughs> you'll you'll hear it when, when the video comes out, but yeah. Okay. It's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> now today, today is June 16th. Today would have been Tupac's uh 52nd birthday. And, wow. you know, he was on his way to really becoming a megastar. And, 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 you know, I was watching him, watching some of his movies like a few few weeks ago. And I just think, like, had he lived, we would have probably seen him, you know, winning Oscars. He would have been in sitcoms. You know, I digress. But hip hop is turning 50 this year. And mm -hmm. Ms. Deanna, for all of you who don't know, is referred to as the hip hop, as, as hip hop's artist whisperer by the New York Times. And now I love that reference, by the way. I want you to share with us. Oh, look at that. Look, 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 look at what we get. I see you. I see you with uh -huh. Bree. Uh -huh. With Bree yeah. Steves. Yeah, Bree Steves. And it was a full page article. And yes, they dubbed me the hip, hip hop whisperer because at that time, well, first of all, I have a diverse clientele in all genres of music. All genres. I've done heavy metal. I've done Menudo, the group that switches out kids when they get to a certain age. But at that point, hip hop was the number one genre. And the New York Times writer, Joe Coscarelli, came back to me and started asking me more questions regarding hip hop. And I was like, wait, hold up. You do realize that I do pop artist. I've worked with Shawn Mendes. I mentioned Justin Bieber. Come on, Rihanna, she's a pop artist. So I was like, wow, the hip hop questions all of a sudden. He says, well, my editor, it's the number one genre in the world. And we kind of want to feature the fact that you are one of the individuals, coaches that preps artists in that genre. Because a lot of my clientele, I've worked with everyone from T.I. to Trina to Little Kim. So I've worked with tons of hip hop artists, uh, but they chose to they chose to call me the hip hop whisperer. I would just say I am the artist whisperer because I deal with artists in all genres. Yeah. I like that. But I want you to share with me, share with us, mm. one of your most memorable hip hop moments. Oh, <laughs> so many, so many. I was with T.I. eight years. He's one of my faves. I worked with him while he was at Atlantic Records for eight years. And I did everything with Tip from manage a courtroom where he was coming up for an arraignment or going before the judge. And on one side, this is outside of the courtroom, there were his fans, tons of them. Another side, there were the record company executives from Atlantic Records. And then there was a place where his family was. And folks were just getting very excited. And, and they were like, we are going to close the courtroom and nobody is going to get in. 
So I started negotiating with the uh, the courtroom bailiff and the sheriff and all of the, the people involved in the courtroom. And I had to organize everybody and no- negotiate with everybody and say, look, we're none of us are going to get in here if y'all keep acting, you know, like fools up in here, up in here. So that was a memorable moment, ma- managing the courtroom. And, and even further with Tip, we did the um, Larry King show. I used to watch Larry King every night on CNN. Me too. And there I was. Okay. There I was in California with Tip, Sidney Markinson, his publicist, his longtime publicist and still friend. Um, so I did a lot with Tip. But I've worked with, I love working with the female hip hop artists. And I've worked with, like I mentioned, Trina, Little Kim. Little Kim, um, I worked with her one time in preparation for the Howard Stern show. And that was memorable. So what do you think about the state of hip hop today? I love hip hop. I love hip hop. I'm not big on drill. I've also worked with drill artists. I'm just not big on drill. Um, it's not my preferred genre. I'm not in the car, you know, bopping to drill. I'm not at home listening to drill. However, I understand it for that generation. I understand that's for them. But old school hip hop, I love old school hip hop. Rakim, Eric B., um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm, since I'm a New York girl, you know, I love, I'm more of a tribe called Quest hip hop girl. Um, I love Lauren Hill. I mean, you know, the, these are the artists that I tend to gravitate towards the ones that have more of a positive message in the music is what I tend to lean towards. But hip hop, number one genre, billion dollar industry. Drake, one of the highest rated streamed artist on all streaming platforms, Drake. You know, I love Pharrell and I, I'm a, I, I still love hip hop. So I listen to it in between listening to, I love country, black country artists. Brittany Spencer is one of my clients and she is a hip hop artist. I'm sorry, a country artist from Baltimore who lives in Nashville. Rissy Palmer, uh, Mickey Guyton, uh, I, I love the black country Jimmy artist. Allen is one, Jimmy Allen. Jimmy Allen, mm-hmm. yeah. I don't listen to Jimmy's music as much. Okay. I had dinner with me last year in Nashville, uh, but I love Britney Spencer. She's my favorite uh, country. And and a woman named Frankie Staten, who was the pioneer, grown woman, close to my age, uh, Frankie Staten. Um, yeah. There's a great documentary, uh, if you love country music, uh, and this focuses on Black country artists is called For Love and Country, For Love of Country, For Love of Country, I believe is, uh, yeah. There's a wonderful woman named Trina Furby, who a lot of people should know. Trina is, she is the incarnation of Sister Rosetta Tharp. She plays the guitar, she performs. Trina Furby, love her. Now I hear that you're gonna be judging a gospel competition. Tell us about that. <laughs> Yeah, for WHYY TV, yes. they're doing a gospel competition. I am a grand judge, along with Marcus John Bryant and some other people. And so I love hearing talent, people who are aspiring to find their path of joy and fulfillment. And so I'm looking forward to hearing. And it's a Delaware Valley, so it's Philadelphia, right. New Jersey, Delaware, Primarily, the call went out. So I've not yet heard any of the music, any of the artists, but I'm ready to listen. Well, listen, if any of you all are interested, get those submissions in ASAP, because like I say every show. All right. And speaking of gospel, um, I have another thing I'm going to lay on you that, you know, I go back and forth with my friends about. I've had this long running debate that gospel is closely connected to house music. What do you think about that? Well, in terms of the spirit and the energy that comes out of house music, a good friend of mine, her name is Lady Am. Oh, here we go again, another good friend. I have a lot of good friends. Lady, but Lady Am, who I'm presenting first. I'm producing 
uh, concert on the Avenue of the Arts South on Locust Street with uh, Lady Alma being the headliner. And she is a well-known beloved house artist from Philadelphia. So the similarities I believe is the spirit. You know, in gospel music, you it's the spirit of praising the Lord. And in house music, it's the same kind of energy of praising. I'm not an ethnomusicologist, but since you, you know, drew, drew a parallel between those two genres, I would agree that there is some synergy between those two forms of music. And, and July 1st, on the Academy of the Arts, it's part of the Welcome America Festival. I'm one of the producers and I'm presenting talent starting at 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. It is all free. I'm excited because my daughter is a singer, songwriter, and artist, and she is going to be performing. Her name is Princess Idea Gamble. She is the youngest daughter and child of Kenny Gamble and myself. So um, Idea will be performing songs from her album, I Am Idea, produced by her father and herself. And um, we have um, Tara Hendricks and um, V. Fedricks. It's going to be an exciting day. Um, Helen Bruner and Terry Jones performing, and it's all free on the Avenue of the Arts as part of the Welcome Gotta America come down there for that. Now, listen, I, I got to come down there for that. Yeah. that. That I definitely yeah, it's gonna have to come down for. And yeah. I'm going to drag my mother out of the house for that, too. My mother's in Philly still. I'm going to drag Bring her out for that. Yes. Bring yes. mama. Bring, yes. bring her out. Definitely. But this was my theory. My theory with gospel and house, and it was that house garnered such a strong following in black gay clubs because a lot of black queer people came up in the church and they knew the hymns, they knew the rhythms. And the overall vibe and energy of gospel was, you know, welcoming and uplifting even when the black church itself wasn't. I don't know. I just, I come up mm -hmm. with things. I just, I just become. Yeah. It, it is all good. I do. But I want to ask you something. Um, it's not so much music related, but it's still within the, the realm of entertainment. Um, what do you think about the biopics and the plays that they're doing on these artists? I am a student and an aficionado of the musical documentary form. So I'm also anticipating the Sound of Philadelphia documentary. I don't know what they're gonna call it, but it is currently being produced by director Sam Pollard. And my son, Khalif Gamble, who is a filmmaker and a videographer, is part of the team that's recording the interviews with everybody from Shirley Jones of the Jones Girls to Dee Dee Sharp, who was Kenny Gamble's first wife. And so it's a documentary that I cannot wait to see especially because I have lived the sound of Philadelphia and the TSOP and the Gamble Huff Bell story. It is, it's my family's story. And all of the artists that were part of Philadelphia International Records, my family's record label, from Phyllis Hyman to Jean Karn. Jean Karn is godmother to my oldest son, Khalif, who I just wow. mentioned, to, um, to you know McFadden and Whitehead, Bunny Siegler, MFSB, Linda mm -hmm. Creed, there's a, a plethora of artists that were signed to Philly International. Uh, Earl Young, my son just is working on a documentary when we speak about documentaries on Earl Young, Four on the Floor. He was primary drummer for most of the Gamble Huff Bell sessions. And he is alive, he's in his eighties and he's thriving. And he also was the founder of the Tramps. So, you know, I love the pre music. I love the stylistics. I saw Russell Tompkins Jr. recently, the lead singer of the stylistics at a, an event. Um, the Intruders I just was with um, the King of Hooks, who is the lead singer of the current Intruders group now. So the sound of Philadelphia for me, mind you, I love Motown. I grew up listening to Motown. Uh, I honored Barry Gordy some years ago with the Marian Anderson Award, but the sound of Philadelphia is what I am most fond of because right. <laughs> I lived with the man who was writing the lyrics to many of those exactly. beautiful songs. You were there. The OJ, yeah. Darling Baby. Yeah. That was, I was there. Now, I was there. I was there in the sessions. Mm -hmm. And I've seen those photos and everybody you know who's watching 
do your Google. So you'll see those pictures um, from back then. I heard they were doing a Phyllis Hyman one and they that Jasmine Sullivan was supposed to be. No, to my knowledge, okay. Jasmine has been asked and she has said no. And I don't. Right. Jasmine and I have uh, we share a hairstylist. And the last I heard and I know her mother, Pam, and her other manager, um, I think she has said no. But I think she's the ideal casting to do Phyllis Hyman. Uh, voice-wise, statuesque, like Phyllis. Um, so I'm praying that at some point she overstands that that's her Oscar. I hope and pray the Phyllis Hyman story. Glenda Gracia, who worked at Philadelphia International as well, she is an attorney. She was Phyllis's manager, and she's the executrice of the Phyllis Hyman estate. I'm prayerful that that film, the biopic of Phyllis Hyman, gets told. She deserves it. She was a Broadway star. Yeah. She was, a, um, you know, just an incredible singer. And yeah. I really, you know, adore her. She was, yeah, adore she, her. She was, an, she was a mercurial woman, a mercurial yeah. woman. You know, if we, I would like to see Jasmine do it also. Um, I also think uh, the actress Gina Torres, who years ago she played on, um, she did Dream Girls. I think uh, she'd be a good choice too to play Phyllis. Mm -hmm. um, Gina Torres would. Um, but now also, I remember hearing years ago that there was supposed to be a Teddy Pendergrass biopic involving either Jaheim or Tyrese. I mean, that's, this is over a decade ago. I introduced Jaheim. Jaheim was one of my clients. Mm -hmm. And I took, I invited Jaheim to Teddy's house many years ago. Vibe magazine did a story on it and it was the oil and water situation. Anyhow, moving right along. Yes, let's move Tyrese, along. Um, yeah. yeah. Tyrese has been uh, announced as okay. the individual who will play, but I believe that project is still up in the air. Right. I mean, personally, I'd love mm -hmm. to see a Luther biopic, but we have to get someone who but, could really do Luther justice. I think the person who could vocally execute Luther Vandross is Will Downing, but not as an actor. Will is not an actor. I don't think he's trying to act. Right. He's a comedian, though. He's a very funny guy. Every is, time he I really? talk to him, he's, is he really? He's very, oh, oh, he's so funny. I keep telling him, I said, why are you negating this other part of you? Yeah. Where you could go out and stand up, but his stand up is on the stage singing. Wow. And like, I have a lot of, and, I've had a lot of comedians <laughs> on, on the show. And uh -huh. it's just, it's all about timing, you know? But, it, it, I'd love to meet him one day. I I, I I adore Will Downing. He's like, in my head, he's like my uncle <laughs> in my head. But now this is what I want to ask you. Who would play you in your biopic? Uh, again, a, a TV show is being developed around me at, right now. There's a, there is a treatment. There's a whole, and it's what I call faction, because it's fiction mixed in with factual information, faction. Uh, and there, there's been discussion, my manager, we've talked about who would play Deanna. And it then becomes a question of Deanna at what phase. There's a 18, 19 year old who just got into radio, met Kenny Gamble, fell in love. You know, it just, there's different Deanna's. So, but I, I saw somebody that I liked. Who was it? I'm trying to remember that I liked and I thought she would be great. I can't think of it right what now. What was she but... on? Do you remember what show she was on or, or what movie? Oh, I know who it is. It just came back to me when you said what show. She was on Atlanta. Oh, uh, Zazie Beats. Okay. Beats. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. I love Zazzy I Beats. It. I can see it. When I saw her, I was like, ooh, Zazzy Beats. I would love her to play me. Yes. Zazzy Beats. Listen, make it happen. Y'all make it happen, Ms. Deanna. Um, <laughs> Y'all make it happen for her. Let everyone know how they can get in touch with you. I mentioned my website earlier. It's influenceentertainment.com. And you can go to the website and there's a place where people can write. And um, my assistant 
And uh, my right hand, she helps me run my company. Her name is Deja Scriven. and her email, I believe, is on there. But she checks, we check all emails and we do our best to respond to everyone. When I said we get tons and tons and tons of emails um, and we do our best to respond. I'm sure we miss some people, but at the end of the day, even on my social media, all of my social media is Deanna, D-Y-A-N-A, Williams. And that's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and what else is there? TikTok? All of the social media. Are you media. on TikTok? I am not on TikTok. Neither I am I. To... Okay, I'm not Neither on TikTok. I'm that's not doing it. They barely that's got me on Instagram. I barely wanted to do that. <laughs> so. Okay, I, I was told by my, my peoples, they were like, some years ago, I think I got on maybe, and they were like, you got to be on social media. And I was like, why do I have to be on social media? But I get it. I mean, why do you have to be on social media? You are social media. Let me remind everyone how they can get in touch with you. So that's Deanna Williams, all one word, on Instagram. D is in Deborah, Y is in Yvette, A is in Aretha, N is in Natalie, A is in Anita. Williams, go follow the founder of Black Music Mom and be respectful if you choose to DM her. Don't talk crazy. She reps BX, Harlem, and Philly. And if you watched last week's show, you know all about the switches. So don't do it. All right. Don't do it. Now, I have to tell you this. You've always been an auntie in my head. And I said that even before I saw you. I used to listen to you on the radio. I used to just hear you. And you look like my aunts. And I, I just had to say that. You just always just in my head. That's just always who you've been. Um, but I want to know, who is Deanna Williams outside of the music and the entertainment world? Mm -hmm. Outside of the music and entertainment world, which I'm so very much enshrined with, I'm a free-spirited, loving humanity. I'm, I'm, I'm a God-first woman. I love the creator. I see the creator. I am a God-loving woman, family, friends. I'm a devoted friend. And you have me as a friend. You've got a real good friend because I care about my friends. I don't know how I keep up because I have a lot of friends. I'm an only child. So my community of people that I have, you know, in my embrace are many, um, some closer than others. I came up with an expression some years ago. I said, some people are meant to be uh, in the front row or in the orchestra section. Some should be in the balcony and others should be online, standing outside at the box office being told it's a sold out show. So it's not for everybody. Uh, but I have my orchestra section and they are mutually supportive of me as I am of them. And so I am fun loving. I love to laugh. I like to get with my friends. I like to laugh till we falling on the floor. Uh, I love uh, the arts. I am, you know, I'm, I'm a, an art collector. I have art everywhere, bathrooms, kitchen. Uh, I have a, 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 a Ramir beard in my kitchen. I am a uh, lover of travel. I am a curious woman. I'm a woman that seeks knowledge. And I like also, it's very important to me to help others, which I believe is why I am a great coach because I'm interested in people uh, actualizing their full potential. So I'm just a joie de vivre um, loving person that loves our culture. I am... Um, I am a pro black music activist. I'm a devoted Nana and I love my children and uh, love my mother. I still have my mother with me. And so I'm a, I'm a lover of life. Yeah. That's, that's I, what's beautiful. the word? And I'm a saposexual. Oh, yeah, sapio. Sap sapio. Sapio. Yes, sapiosexual. I'm a sapiosexual yes, too. Love that. Now see, <laughs> we like to have fun on the Chris David Show. And I want to know, what's in Ebony Moonbeam's playlist? Oh, I'm listening to Aries, um, the twins that uh, have just- Ayana and- and uh, Yinka. 
Yes. I'm listening yes. to Better Days. I'm listening to Marcus John Bryant, a.k.a. Rated Art, one of my dear, dear friends. I'm listening to Brittany Spencer, who has a new album coming out, Top of the Year. I listen, like I said, I listen to Black country artists. And then I'm listening to, I was listening to Ladies Man by Shaka Khan. So it's from, it's all genres, all decades. I'm always listening for new artists. I'm open to sonic, soul satisfying music. That's what I'm interested in. So, but those are some of the artists and people that I'm listening to. I wake up to Earth, Wind and Fire. Usually when I'm in the shower, I listen to Open Our Eyes uh, and Keep Our Head, Keep Your Head to the Sky. I love music that inspires me to to lift up and to be better and to deal with the challenges that face us in this world. And they are many. So I need music that is nurturing and music that is um, positive for me. You know, I did my research and now that Ebony Moonbeams, that came, that was a jazz record, wasn't it? George Cables wrote the song. My understanding mm -hmm. is he heard my show, met me. Uh, he wrote the song. I was actually trying to reach out to him recently because I wanted to get the, the, the factual, actual story. But that's what I was told. And then the song was recorded by, re-recorded by Bobby Hutchinson afterwards okay. and then um, Freddie Hubbard. So it is. And I think Nicholas Payton may have done the song as well. So the trumpet players seem to like me. And well, George Cable's a keyboard player who's still living. But yes, I have a song named after my radio show. And it's very exciting. Good. Yeah. But I have songs also written and inspired for me. Remember, I was right. with a songwriter for years. Okay. Yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Now, how many of you girls out there can say that? But you got somebody writing songs for you. Uh, don't get my best friend hating on me again because she was with a musician for many years and I don't think she got a song out of it. And she was, she has oh. very openly articulated her, her disdain. Kathy Hughes, I was honored at the Living Legends Foundation, I think it was 2019. And in her presenting me with the award she was hating on me talking about all these songs that have been written for me i was like girl wait aren't you here to honor me and here you are you know breaking me down and and and, and being a jealous bee okay listen miss miss kathy she said that i ain't see that she said that all right oh i just i'll tell her straight she knows i told her that <laughs> I'm like why are you hating okay you should be celebrating I'll share, I'll share with you my playlist really quickly. Um, so, and this is from a few weeks ago. This is almost from almost a month ago. I've had these songs playing. Um, Patti LaBelle in Love Again, Grace Jones Inside Story, um, Private Dancer. Um, and, and the thing is, Private Dancer, before Tina had passed, like a few weeks before, mm -hmm. that had been playing like over and over in my head. And something was just like, Chris, just go download that album. Just, just go listen to it. And 1984 is probably one of my favorites off of that album. Um, Natalie Cole, Everlasting. And I'll tell you about Natalie Cole really quickly. This popped up. This is, you know, this is in my playlist right now. That is probably the first tape that I can remember ever seeing. And it was in my father's Toyota Cressida. Also, I have uh, Anita Baker's songstress, Jones Girls, uh, At Peace With Woman, because I like sitting on top of the world. And I like At Peace With Woman. I think that's something everyone in the world we're living in needs to go out and listen to. But then I also have, um, I have a lot of Colonel Abrams in here. I love Colonel Abrams. Mm -hmm. um, Alexander O'Neill. Um, love Makes No Sense gets played at least like once a weekend. Um, I have Believe in Love, Teddy Pendergrass. That's one of my favorites. Um, Chucky Booker, nice about, make sure Chucky, two eyes, double eyes. And also uh, the group Today is in here. And so I think for the weekend, I'm gonna do um, 90s female groups because Total and Jade had, sh had shuffled a little earlier when I was getting ready for the show. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of 
the place. Yeah. Great list. But, like, peace with women. Uh, and I remember when Gamble was writing, um, there would be no peace until man's at peace with women. And Shirley Jones remained a friend and a sister. Je Shirley mm -hmm. Jones, Jean Carn, we're all close. Yeah. But that was a great song. And, I don't hear like that song often. And, and love Jean Carn, by the way. She still got like all of her wits about her. Mm -hmm. She's still sharp. Like, yeah, we just unsung on Gene last year, and I, I saw hated for that unsung since 2008. So, when last year we were able to finally get wow. it done, I was very mm -hmm. happy. Um, Gene again in the room with me when I gave birth to each of my three children, real close. Wow. Yeah, good. And shout out to her. Hi, Miss Jean. Shout out to you. Shout out, Miss Diana. Before we wrap, mm -hmm. I'd like to ask all my guests this. If you had a time machine, what would you go back and tell yourself in the past? If I had a time machine, I would go back and tell myself that I'm going to have a splendid, spirited experience as a human being on this planet. I'm going to be learning, hungry. I'm going to meet some incredible people. Um, Gordon Parks was a good friend of mine, somebody who I aspired to meet, and I finally met him a little late in life, but became friends. I am, I would say, couldn't just be fearless. I'm a fearless, I was a fearless young teenage and child, child and teenager and young woman. Uh, you're going to um, have some incredible, magical, memorable moments and to hold them dear and precious which I do. Do you have anything else that you have coming up that you want us to know about? I would say follow my social media to keep up with me. I'm a pretty active person. I've got a lot going on. Um, as I mentioned with you earlier, I'm doing the Welcome America Fest as one of the producers. Shout out to Michael Delbane, the CEO of Welcome America, who brought me on to showcase young, talented people and grown, talented people. I'll come to our event. It's going to be July 1st on the Avenue of the Arts on Locust and Broad and starts at 11 a.m. until 7 p.m. But the uh, Welcome America Festival, 10 days in Philadelphia throughout our communities. And keep watching Unsung. We have, uh, right now, we have a, a series of specials. I'm on a few of those, which are Really excellent. Shout out to the unsung producers and um, keep listening to Radio One. It's my radio home. I'm also a guest commentator on WURD FM. It is progressive black talk radio in Philadelphia owned by the Lomax family, a black family. They have an AM and an FM and we're also online at WURDradio.com. So much. So just follow the it social is. media that we gave, D-E-Y-A-N-A, -E Williams, and uh, keep up and uh, stay yes. in touch. And shout out to WURD really quickly because I interned for them many years ago. Oh. Ishimu Jeremoji. Shout out to him. Yeah. Yes. I he know. gave me a flag and everything. This has been an honor for me coming from where I'm from. Like, I am truly grateful to have been in your presence. I want us to do this in person one day. And I just have to thank you for coming on and come back again and again and again, because you are a wealth of knowledge for all of us, for everybody, from, from the very young to, to the older folks. And you're also folks, a Scorpio. Okay. I'm in the older Like folks. I said, well, I'm talking about older than us, yeah. older than you, older, old, 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 you know, the older folks, because everybody can learn. We're all here yeah. to learn. The good and grown. The good and you see, I'm writing that down. I like that. I like that. But you're also a Scorpio, one of my favorite signs other than mine. Capricorn. So before we go, though, before we go now, I'd be remiss if mm -hmm. I didn't acknowledge the fact that this is this month is the uh, 53rd annual uh, Pride Month. And in the Black queer community, there are houses and family titles used to acknowledge people who keep those houses together. So I couldn't let you go, Ms. Deanna Williams, without giving you the title of overall mother of the culture. Oh. Because that is what you are. You are the overall mother of the culture. Oh my goodness. Okay? 
Mm -hmm. You see these flowers back here? Those are your flowers. So I'm giving you your flowers. All right? And I was... So, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone clap it up for the illustrious Ms. Deanna Williams. And let's clap it up for all of you. I'm grateful for you all as well. And I thank you for watching and listening to The Chris David Show. Tell your friends, tell your mama, tell your daddy, tell your baby daddy, tell your boyfriend, tell your sister, tell your cat, tell your dog, tell baby your doctor. Daddy. Okay? <laughs> now, everyone who loves Black music to follow us on Instagram at Chris David TV and follow our show at The Chris David Show on Instagram and YouTube. You can also visit chrisdavidshow.com. There you'll find everything you need to know about the show. Be kind and be well.